Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Zoom Into Nature Sandhill Cranes. This evening, we'll be diving into the natural history of Sandhill Cranes with Ann Lacey of the International Crane Foundation. I want to thank Tom and Kathy Lydon for sponsoring tonight's virtual program. The Lydons are devoted supporters of species conservation and understand the importance of protecting diverse, balanced ecosystems for the survival of all plants and animals. Thank you, Tom and Kathy. I am Renee Baranca, the Manager of Conservation Education and Outreach at Western Reserve Land Conservancy. At the Land Conservancy, I develop nature-based programming, both virtually and in person, for people of all ages, often utilizing the expansive network of conservation properties the Land Conservancy has protected in Northeast Ohio, which totals close to 70,000 acres of natural landscape, family farms, and urban green spaces. Tonight, we are focusing on Sandhill Cranes. Years ago, I had the good fortune of visiting a farm field south of Valparaiso, Indiana during crane migration. It was an amazing experience to see tens of thousands of sandhill cranes with their landing gear down, settling in for the night. Then we rose early the next morning, headed back to the field, and watched them depart. It is one of those must-see nature experiences. November is the best time to see it, and I encourage you to go if you can. During tonight's presentation, please place your questions in the Q&A section at the bottom of the screen. It is my pleasure to introduce Ann Lacey. Ann is the Senior Manager of the North American Program for the International Crane Foundation. Ann attended graduate school at the University of Minnesota Duluth. After finishing her coursework in 2000, she accepted an internship at the International Crane Foundation while finishing the thesis. After completion of her master's degree, Anne accepted a full-time position at the Crane Foundation, working on an ongoing long-term study of sandhill cranes. She added whooping crane work in 2009 when she joined the Whooping Crane Reintroduction Project to study the ecology of a newly reintroduced population in Wisconsin. Welcome, Anne. Thank you so much. I uh, yeah, this is this is talking about the work that I started on as an intern is what I'll be talking about today, but I'll, I'll manage to throw in a little bit of whooping cranes as well. <laughs> Yay, <laughs> sounds good. <laughs> All right, you're ready, ready to go? Yes, go ahead. All right, I, and here we are. So this is the who, what, where, and why, and maybe some how is of Santo cranes um, that are here in North America. And this is a presentation that I and my colleague Andy Gossens put together, and he is our uh, manager of our Sandhill Crane program, so he does a bulk of this work. And I would also like to, to thank Tom and Kathy, craniacs of the highest order, um, for supporting this talk tonight. So thank you guys very, very much. So let's get started. Here we are. And uh oh, let's let's make sure that my... Uh, There we go. Santo cranes in North America. There are 15 species of cranes in the world. There are two here in North America. The most abundant crane species in the world, the Santo crane, and the rarest species in the world, the whooping crane. And they, they both occur here and they both occur in this, uh, the Eastern Flyway is what we're in currently. So Grus canadensis is the, the species and genus that we're talking about today. And again, they're the most numerous crane species and they are generalists. So you can see the in green on that map, the broad uh, breeding range, even over into Russia. Um, and they occupy multiple flyways in different populations. And there's also three non-migratory populations of, uh, of cranes, uh, Santo cranes. So I'll be talking about in specifically the Eastern population of Santo cranes, this is made up of greater subspecies. So there's greater, lesser, and Canadian. <laughs> that is kind of an integrate in between. Um, and those make up the bulk of that uh, majority of uh, breeding birds in the north and over into Russia. There is a non-migratory population subspecies in Mississippi a different subspecies in Florida and also a subspecies in Cuba, which I so hope to be able to see soon. We're, we're starting some work down in Cuba to, to know more about that endangered subspecies. So what we're going to focus on today um, is this eastern population and specifically what we have learned um, about our breeding population here in Wisconsin and how 
what we've learned about those cranes can um, apply to other more endangered cranes, like the other one we have here in Wisconsin is the whooping crane. So there on the left is a, a figure from a paper that I wrote in, in 2015, looking at the expansion of this population, just this, um, just this one uh, in uh, the Eastern population. So if, what you can see there is all of those little specks in the Eastern, the entire Eastern portion of the US east of the Mississippi River, those are all breeding bird survey sites. And then the dark dots are where they found sandhill cranes. So starting from 1966, when the breeding bird survey started through 1977, you can see the bulk are in Wisconsin and then up in the upper, Mich upper peninsula of Michigan. So that star is a GMC, the um, general um, mean center. So that is like the, the center of the density of where that breeding bird was, breeding birds were found. And you can see as time goes on, it, those birds are expanding both a little bit to the east and to the west and a little bit to the south. And so you can see how that concentration there stays about in Wisconsin. So we still have kind of the bulk of those breeding birds in this population are, are here. And what I, what I don't have is the, the, the wintering pup, uh, expansion where these birds are wintering now is even as far north as Northern Indiana and even some in Wisconsin and Michigan. So um, they're, it's a big population now. They are absolutely a conservation success story. So back in the 60s, they you know, were just starting their comeback and they are, are well on their way to becoming a, um, obviously very successful here, but they are expanding their range well east. So what I'd like to do is go through the annual cycle of a crane, just in, just in general. So we'll start um, this spring migration. All these birds are coming back for us. Um, these birds are, are breeding um, a bulk again in Wisconsin and, and Michigan, but they're also going up into Canada and the Eastern provinces, and they are expanding into Ohio, Indiana, and uh, Illinois as well. So spring migration happens, you know, early February by March, a lot of breeding birds are back. They don't have a very long migration route. So their arrival on their breeding grounds, they're doing their unison calls, they're highly territorial. So part of that early, early-ish migration arrival is because they are fighting for those territories. It's all about the real estate. So they're, they're arriving there, there's unison calls, they're defending that territory, telling everybody else, this is mine to stay out. They're going about building their nests um, by April. Um, uh, they have their nests and they're incubating. They incubate those two eggs usually on every nest for 30 days. Um, if they lose their first clutch, they can re-nest within that time period. But by June, we have these lovely little young'uns that are, are going through the spring grasses in June and July. Um, even those re-nests are, are hatched by then. Um, by end of August into September, we're starting to see the family groups come out and using those agricultural fields that have been harvested and the birds come together in large groups, exactly like what Renee was talking about in Jasper Pulaski Wildlife Area um, in the fall. And they gather together in those very, very large groups, um, staging for migration, but also sometimes wintering that far north as well. And here's one of those maps that I was talking about, actually. So in the wintertime, they're not, they're not gone for very long um, in this population. Their winter is very short. End of November to maybe end of January, is been, then they'll start making their way north again. But this map shows uh, from that same paper that I talked about, these are Christmas bird count. All of those X's are Christmas bird count sites. And those circles are where there was cranes found on a Christmas bird count and the size of the circle corresponds to the number of cranes. So that same GMC, the, the, the center of that density back in the, the, the late 60s, early 70s, when I, when I, the first time frame that I looked at was fully in the center of Florida where those birds were wintering. And by 2002, 2013 timeframe, that, that mean center 
was moved all the way up to northern Georgia. So you can see those birds are spread out from Wisconsin, Michigan, even Ontario, all the way down and even over into Louisiana. And some of those birds are the eastern population. And some of those are the, the mid-continent population. So uh, the other spot that you have, we can talk about this later, but the other spot that you have to, to really visit is the Platte River migration. So the birds that famously go through the Platte River in March on their spring migration, some of them um, meet up with this population on their wintering grounds down there in Louisiana. So there is some mixing of the population there. So that's their annual cycle. They, they round and round they go, north and south breeding, hopefully have two trick, chicks, sometimes none at all, most times none at all actually, and we'll talk about that a little later. So here's their, their ecology. These are long lived birds. They get through their, their, their year as a small chick where they're very vulnerable and into their first year where they're flying free and on their own. Um, they can live more than 30 years in the wild. And we've documented that many times with our, our banding work that we'll talk about in a little bit. As far as habitat, they really love to feed in those open upland areas, also some wetland, but they have to roost in water. Uh, so they, they cannot roost in trees. They do not have a hind toe that they can grab onto a branch with. They have to, uh, they can have to stay on the ground. So they roost in water for protection, but they are also obligate uh, wetland nesters. So their nest is always in a wetland, but they really like foraging in those open uplands, which in our part of the world, at least, almost always is some sort of agricultural land. They really occur in two very distinct social groups with different uh, behaviors and attitude, quite honestly. So we have all of the breeding birds. These are territorial birds that uh, occupy a territory that uh, actively exclude other birds from that. So they are philopatric. They, there's your scrabble word, crossword word of the day. Um, they that territory they will maintain, they will return to that year after year after year. Um, if it is a productive, uh, so the, the, the very rich fertile soils, especially up here in, in post glacial landscapes that we have here, very fertile, um, they can have a productive territory that's pretty small, definitely less uh, than a square mile. But you also have non-territorial individuals. So cranes reach sexual maturity at about three and probably not until about four or five, they successfully nest. So from when they reach independence at one until they find a territory, they are in these very um, sometimes large up here anyway, in this, the density of cranes that we have, very large non-breeding groups. And so they forage opportunistically and, and come and go from their roosting wetland throughout the, the summer up here. And at least in Wisconsin, it can be up to half of the population. And right now we estimate the Eastern population at minimum is about 95,000 birds, probably closer to 100,000, but at least half of those are probably non-breeding birds. And they, they can move up to two miles from their roost site to forage. Whereas, you know, especially a breeding pair, if they have young, they can only go as far as that young chick can walk and where they can, they can still be in that territory. So they are omnivorous. It kind of goes with them being that, that generalist and why they were, have become such a conservation success story. Um, they really do a good job of um, operating in these human dominated landscapes. So here we are, that star is where I am speaking to you from. That's our, uh, the headquarters of the International Crane Foundation in Baraboo, Wisconsin. And just on the other side of the Wisconsin River to the Northeast of me, as the crane flies about 10 miles or so is our long-term research site. So we have been here doing uh, crane breeding bird ecology there for about 30 years at least and learned a load about these birds. So the very generalized map on the right-hand side there, that's about 30 square miles or so. Um, and that is entirely 
private lands with those scattered wetlands and agriculture there in the yellow right next to those wetlands. So it is pretty perfect crane habitat and why we have such a intense density of, of breeding birds. And I'll, I'll explain how dense in just a minute. So why study cranes here? Um, it is that mix of ag lands with those wetlands. So again, these birds have to nest in wetlands and with these agricultural lands right up to the edge of these wetlands, we can pack a lot of territories in, but we have um, open water for these breeding flocks, non-breeding, excuse me, flocks to roost in, in pretty, pretty good densities. Um, this is a picture from this study area. And we have those breeding pairs and non-breeding flocks. So we can really look at, compare and contrast the difference in behaviors from these two different social groups. But even more specifically, um, we've been asked this question actually, they're doing just fine. They've recovered, there's a lot of them. This is a really successful species. Why are you studying them? Um, well, personally, I want to make sure that they stay. <laughs> a conservation success story. But in this population and this place in particular, we really use it as a training area. And that picture on the top, you can see um, Andy, Andy Gosson's there on the right. Um, he's measuring the wing cord of an adult sandhill crane. And there's two interns and two colleagues from Vietnam. So we use this as a training area for future conservation professionals, but also our crane colleagues worldwide. Um, we use it as an outdoor classroom and uh, we can experiment on these because they are non-endangered populations. So we can test out new types of transmitters, for example, on these birds that we probably wouldn't want to try on say a whooping crane. But everything that we learn on these birds, we can inform about other populations of cranes and certainly other species in the world. And how do we do that? Simple plastic, <laughs> quite honestly, a lot of plastic bands. So we started 1990, um, a very small scale, we started banding birds. And that was partially to train people from our uh, worldwide projects on how to do this. Since then, we've banded almost 600, as I need to update this after this year, almost 600 individual birds. So we ban breeding adults. So their territory is marked. So every year then we would go back and, and ban their chicks. And then we can see, you can on that bird that's in the picture, you can see that those very colorful bands, we have a number band, we have a unique color combination with that. And of course, each bird gets a, a metal band from the uh, bird banding laboratory. When we recite these birds, then it goes into our database, which has an enormous amount of sightings. So there on the, on the right-hand side, you can see closer up and that bird actually has a radio transmitter also on its the colored leg band. So we use radio telemetry, um, infrequently satellite telemetry, and we more often used radios. Um, but between the number, the color combination, whether or not it has a transmitter, we can almost always identify the individual. Well, we, of course, need to have a bird in hand more often than not to read the breeding, uh, the bird banding lab metal tag. So we really, that's just part of the combination. But of course, we don't use that until it actually would be in hand. But please, if you would ever see a banded bird and of of any ilk really. If you see a crane, please, you can report it to us at bandedcranes.org. Um, and it's fantastic when we these birds leave on migration, we're not gonna see them again until spring, but lots and lots of people now are going to places like Jasper Pulaski or Hiawassee down in Tennessee and seeing um, a lot of birds. And every now and again, you find one with the, with the bands on its legs. And if it's not ours, we know who might have banded it and we can get that information to them. So from these uh, opportunistic sightings, anytime we see banded birds, you can see in that top picture, that's a family group on a sandbar in the Wisconsin River. And the birds are staging here on the Wisconsin River as we speak. So we can get these behavioral observations. This family group is still together. Um, we know where they came from and they not only fledged two chicks, but two chicks left with them on migration because there's still a gap between when those birds learn to fly 
and when they actually leave on migration. So we know that the whole family is together on migration. We also do driving surveys. Um, so that gives us an idea of all birds, not just ones that are, are marked with colorful bands um, in relation to crop cover. So we, knew, we know if they're using soybeans, if they're using corn, if they prefer pasture as opposed to fallow, that kind of thing. So um, very useful in our crop damage work, which I'll talk about in a little bit. So over time, we can see how that landscape has changed and how, you know, year after year, we do these land cover surveys, match them to how the birds are using them. We do radio telemetry. We do roost counts in the fall. That's how we know how many birds approximately are in this population. Um, and all of those outside observations from people that are out there that love to watch birds and or cranes specifically. And so we get a lot of information from all throughout the flyway and all of it adds up to great, great information. Generally in the biology of these birds, we know a lot about their longevity. So it's how we specifically know that they can live at least 30 years, if not more. We know about pair fidelity, and, and their territory sizes and quality. We know about their nesting density and productivity. So how many young are they putting out year after year? And to some extent, where those young are going as well. So here, here are some stories. Here's the good stuff. So you can see on the left, those are some of the bands that we put on. Those are the bird banding lab bands. So aluminum bands, just like people who miss net small birds put on, except those are size one, one A, two. Our birds have size nine and we rivet them. Those are rivet bands. So they are not coming off at all, but you can see the wear on those bands. Those bands were on over a decade. And so they're right on the, on the, on the bottom of the, the, what the, the foot of the crane. So it's kind of hanging above the toes technically. And you can see years and years and years of being on those bird, those bands have really worn down. And so this is the Earl Bransell female, I believe in that, that picture. For example, they were already breeding birds when they were captured and banded in 1993. So they were at least three years old, probably older than that. And those bands in the lower left corner were put on. And that is what they looked like in 2011. Um, the number band on the right has been cracked, but because we, we glued the overlap, it stayed on, thankfully, so we could still identify that bird. But the, the band on the other leg, so you can see the, the um, bird banding lab aluminum band below, and above that is a red band. It's been on so long that all of the color has completely bleached out. So these birds uh, were captured again and those bands were replaced. They got shiny new, new colors and new uh, breeding bird lab uh, or bird banding lab bands. Same exact territory that they defended that entire time. They fledged 14 chicks in that time, including just last year. So this was our, or at least my favorite pair because these birds were, they would come back every year and unfortunately, this year was the year that we were afraid would happen. And the male did not return. Uh, the female is still on territory and she's there with her new mate. Um, but the, the saga of the Earl Bransell pair, we named them after the landowners. So Earl Bransell has, has long since passed and now that pair is no longer as well. So after 27 years, that was a very, very good run. So that kind of is a, the best example that we have of is how successful this, this species is, that's pretty great. So very similar to that, talking about pair fidelity. So looking at, you know, from this, this you know, knowing these birds and each bird of a, of a pair is marked, we can tell how long they, they stay together. So if we have 119 distinct pairs, sometimes it's the same territory, sometimes it's the same birds that are staying on that same real estate for years. Those pair bonds lasted an average of only four years, but the range is one to 21 years. So they last a long time. 
only three of, or sorry, 23 of those ended in divorce. So here's the first myth buster. Cranes mate for life, more or less. Uh, their annual divorce rate we've calculated is about 5%. And that's from um, another colleague, Matt Hayes, did his PhD on this population in 2015. And so he was able to calculate that. So, so they, they do get divorced, but they still do better than people. So when we're not sure what the drivers of that divorce is. It is, could be that they just don't like each other. It's not you, it's me, or it is you, one of those two. It could be low productivity. Um, but when Matt looked into that, neither one of those theories were supported. So it's really about the, the territory. It's very hard to measure. We can't interview them, they won't answer. So it, it, it might come down to the real estate that is, if they're not a productive pair, they might break up and try their luck someplace else. And where do they nest? So um, these, these pictures are from a, a paper that we put in the uh, proceedings of the North American Crane Working Group. We did three years of helicopter nest surveys. So each of those colored dots are a nest and any one color is a year. So all the red dots are in one year, all the yellow are in another year. And you can see some of those are the same color are plopped on top of each other. That's the same pair coming to almost nearly the same spot year after year, which is awesome. But also some of the dots of the same color are very, very close, which for a territorial species is pretty odd. So we have calculated that this nesting density is greater than any previously known uh, crane species worldwide. Um, and when we looked at some of those, those bigger wetland complexes so that they have greater than five nests, the average density is more than five nests per square kilometer. So that's a lot of nests and some of them are really close. So um, the average minimum distance was 150 meters, which is 500 feet. So again, you know, they might get to know their neighbors over time and be semi-tolerant. You know, I know where you are and you can keep your distance, but boy, if anybody else tries to come in or fly over, they really let them know. They, they, they raise a ruckus. So it's really, really fascinating to see how, how that has changed as these wetlands change over time, also how it's affecting the nesting density. And so now we can look at their productivity. And so on this graph in the black lines, we have the number of marked territories and that's on the right-hand axis. Um, and then in the red, the uh, on the left-hand axis, the number of chicks that survived two fledging from each territory. And that's throughout all of those, those years that we've been calculating this. So since about 2000 or so, the yearly productivity is 0.32. Over this entire time, it's 0.38. So you can see it's kind of gone down. But if we even just look at this time when we have a really steady amount of, of marked territory, so it's about the, the peak. Um, so we know exactly these birds and exactly how many young that they are putting out there into the world. Um, the productivity in red fluctuates wildly. And that is something that we've tried, tried to look into. Um, is it weather, you know, could it be the temperature in spring, precipitation? Is it how the precipitation in the winter before? And so that's how much water is in these wetlands when they're nesting. Uh, predation, of course, is always a, a, a big factor in, in why a chick does not live to fledging. And it's very, very difficult to suss that out, but there is a lot, a lot of variability in that. So it makes us think that this is a conservation success story and adult uh, longevity is, is pretty good, um, but you can never, never be assured that those adults are constantly replacing themselves when any given territory might fledge one chick every three years or so, or, or four. So um, that, that can kind of give us an idea of, of some of, the, some of the, the, the threats that this population might face population-wise. So it turns out that it's a soap opera out there and there's sneaky business going out. We have documented 
extra pair paternity because we've also taken blood samples from these birds. And this is also part of Matt Hayes's uh, dissertation work. So when we looked at the genetics of 77 marked individuals, we tested the 44 chicks and compared them to the parents. And three of those chicks, their DNA meant that the social male, so the bird, uh, the male of the pair that we saw raising this chick could not have been the genetic father. Hmm. Ooh. But one, and this is even more interesting, one chick had the DNA that excluded the social female. So there was a bird that was raising a chick that she did not lay an egg. She probably came into the territory and maybe replaced a, uh, uh, the female there. And so this would happen when we maybe had a, an unbanded pair in the beginning of the season and we did not ban them until the end. And we banded them as a family group, assuming that they had always been a family group. But it turns out that, oh, maybe there was a re replacement. So, the, the number of reasons for this are, are many, and they actually they're ecologically useful. So this is a very, very crowded area. So there's, there's a high, high competition for real estate. There's always birds lurking around, waiting for their opportunity to enter a territory. Um, a male can easily sneak in a copulation. Again, these birds are highly territorial. A male could go off and, and be driving away a bird someplace else and another bird comes in. Um, egg dumping happens in other species and we're not quite sure that it would happen in cranes. It, it should be fairly rare because um, it takes pair bonding um, and there's a, a suite of behaviors that brings these birds into breeding condition. And one of those should be nesting and you know, defending a territory. So a, a it would be very difficult for a female to be able to lay an egg um, if, she was, if she didn't already have a territory. So, um, but this, you know, it, it, this just helps that increase that uh, genetic variability out there. Um, the, as far as we know, cranes will not uh, go in and kill the chick and then immediately, because that won't bring the female into breeding condition. That's more of a seasonal thing. So it's not like some uh, mammals that might do that. Um, it is really real estate. It was worth these, these birds in this example to raise a, a chick that was not theirs. And I'm sure that they did not show it any maybe a, a parental love necessarily, um, but it was worth it to come back the next year um, with that new mate to have that territory. They, they was worth it to them to raise somebody else's chick. So it was just, again, back to that real estate being, being a big driver in this. So I mentioned and showed that picture that had a, a radio transmitter. Um, and um, we also did a study looking at, we put radio transmitters on uh, just young of the year. So uh, chicks of that year, three years uh, running, and then tracked each of those cohorts for three years. And if we look at, so we see the circles are females and the squares are males. And RT means radio telemetry. So at age one, you can see the, the telemetry uh, records from those females, the average distance from their natal area, meaning where they fledged, where their, their nesting area was, where they came from, was over 20 kilometers as compared to the males that were maybe at an average of eight. So the females, even in that first year, are going well away from their natal area. They're, they're dispersing much further away from the males overall. That distance lessens as they get older. They're perhaps pairing and finding a mate, looking for a territory. But by the time they reach age of four and their breeding age or above, that's, you can see that they've pretty much settled in and the average is about 10 kilometers away for females and less than five kilometers away from the breeding area for males. So that also helps that genetic dispersal. This is how we know that, that cranes uh, that are related are most likely not going to be breeding with each other because they take care of that by 
by separating themselves out. So it can, we can see genetic dispersal there, um, how the males and females separate themselves. But on our migration path, we can also kind of get an idea. So those red stars um, in this Eastern migratory uh, pathway are places where we have seen uh, or have had records of our birds recorded from this one small breeding area in Wisconsin. So a majority of them go down to Florida. This is the traditional wintering area since time immemorial. But we're seeing more and more of them go over into Louisiana. And again, I talked about how that's where they probably are mixing with uh, birds from the mid-continent population that are breeding up in Ontario, Northern Ontario. And so with this mixing and breeding, uh, mixing on the wintering area, both with birds from other breeding areas and birds from other populations, there's gonna be lots of genetic mixing in there. So as long as these birds continue that expansion, um, the, the genetic uh, diversity of this population should stay pretty healthy. Um, one thing that we have been able to do in the study area is also look at applied solutions to the anthropogenic threats. And quite honestly, when people say, you know, what's the greatest threat to, to sandhills? And as an adult bird, um, it's us. We are the greatest threat. Uh, they get hit by cars. Um, they, we have these power lines that are in their way um, and they do crop damage. Um, quite a lot of it, it's very intense in the spring on germinating corn here in Wisconsin and also in Michigan. And so we were able to do a lot of testing in our study area and this picture right here kind of shows that red line. Um, you can see the difference between the treated area of that field and the non-treated area. So we helped uh, a company test a seed coating, basically taste bad. And so this was the perfect place with uh, this high density of breeding birds and non-breeding birds. And we can show that this treatment does work. This is something that farmers can apply to their crop to protect it in that very short amount of time that it's vulnerable. And so we also uh, did work uh, looking at this is this picture here is along Interstate 9094, which is literally a mile from me. This picture is just down the road. Um, and these are all these birds that are flying to that Wisconsin River roost and flying off and looking uh, at, you know, going to their foraging areas. And so we were able to look at crane use of this area before they put that power line in. And then when they put that power line in, they agreed to have the lowest tower height that they could. And they agreed to put those power line markers on there. And so that the, both of those types of markers allow the, the birds to see that, that uh, static line that's up above that they are most susceptible to hitting. And when you have thousands of birds crossing that every day for three or almost four months in the fall, um, it, makes a, it makes a big difference. So you can really test some of those uh, protective devices to try to keep them safe from our impact on the landscape. So one of the other things that we were able to do is look at how whooping cranes in reintroduced birds into, they're completely naive to this landscape. So if the sandhills are doing well, can we expect reintroduced whooping cranes to be successful as well? So we looked at three study areas that highlighted the habitat differences across Wisconsin. So Nesita National Wildlife Refuge on the left has the highest density of breeding whooping cranes right now. They also have sandhills. We also looked at our ICF study area, lots and lots of sandhills. I've showed you that already, but there's no whooping cranes breeding there that yet, hopeful. And Horicon. So Horicon is a newer uh, reintroduction area, um, meaning that uh, where we put birds, um, you know, basically we have to teach them what their natal area is because these whooping cranes are raised in captivity. There's also sandhills there. So we had looked at what the productivity and nest success were in these areas. And you can see that this, all of these uh, images are a national land cover database that's consistent. And you can see how different each of these, these areas are um, and how cultivated crops obviously 
dominate in our study area and emergent wetland in Nisida and more um, open water um, cattail marsh in Horicon National Wildlife Refuge. All beautiful areas, by the way, if you have the opportunity to visit. Highly, highly recommend. So we wanted to, to look at the nest success and fledging success of both sandhills and whooping cranes in these areas to see if we can get an idea of maybe what we can expect from whooping cranes. How do we do this? Nest cameras, lots and lots of information from nest cameras. And so uh, we, when we talk about nest success, this means that an egg hatched and a, and a chick was, was produced from this nest. Um, so it really gave us a good idea on the predators. Upper left, you can see uh, some uh, raccoons on the nest and that must have been, you know, the cranes left for whatever reason. They probably would not leave for a raccoon, but they would leave for a coyote, which is what you see in the upper right. Um, but the bottom two pictures are obviously of the same nest. You can see the house in the background. Um, and the date and time you can see there's less than 12 hours, or no, less than 24 for sure. There was a strong rain overnight and what that crane sitting on the, the nest on the left found the next morning was the egg probably floated away and you can see how much the water has risen. So um, there's a lot that they're up against when, they, uh, when they're nesting, but these nest cameras give us so much information. But this is what we like to see. So here on, uh, you can see the, that little, little chick on there. So successful, successful nest that we would never know if we did not have a camera pointed right at that nest. So here are some, some results. And this is um, a majority of this information is taken from a couple of uh, master's projects that um, occurred both at Nasita and Horicon. So we work with a lot of graduate students and get a lot of great information that kind of are helping us chip away at this whooping crane reintroduction to help make it successful. So again, the data from the Nest cameras, a success equals a hatch. And you can see it's it's pretty even um, across those different study areas. And we separated out the successful nests for whooping cranes and sandhill cranes in the CETA. And there is uh, a, a pretty even, a lot of, most nests are very successful. They do hatch out a chick, especially at Horkon as, as it happens. But when we design success for the fledging, very, very different. So, also a very, very different um, number of samples. It is incredibly difficult to get this information. It has to be data from observations of marked birds. So any birds that have those color bands on them. A nest camera will not help fledge, uh, fledging success because those birds are on the move and they quickly move away from the nest and that camera gets only that narrow bit of information. And so you can see the dramatic, fairly dramatic difference between the Santo cranes at the whooping crane and the whooping cranes at Nasita, as well as in our ICF study area. So, so what do we what do we learn from this? Well, it kind of gives us an indication of you know these human dominated landscapes. The sandhills do really really well. Do we want that for whooping cranes? Is that going to be what what makes them successful? Well, we're not sure, but. Um, the actual numbers are going to muddle this a bit. So it a, a few whooping cranes fledging in any one year when a, in a small population makes a really big difference than the same number of sandhill cranes fledging from a much larger population. So during this, this study, we had one year where there were six whooping crane chicks that fledged out of Nasita. So that really helped bump it up. I can tell you, unfortunately, that any given year since then has not been that successful. So we are, we're still trying, but we're, we're still learning a lot of information and Sandhills are, are helping us with that whooping crane reintroduction. So one of the things that jazzes me the most are the questions from you, and I hope that we have time to answer some questions after this. Um, um, but often they are about negative interactions. And so the potential for conflict certainly increases when we have these cranes and human dominated landscapes, which is pretty much the entirety of the Eastern seaboard of the US. Um, so we actually have this on our website and a lot of um, information to kind of help people negotiate um, 
but here are some of the common inquiries that we get. Oh, you know, cranes in my backyard. So crane damage to, to houses, to golf courses. Um, uh, there's a lot that can be that can be done. So really you have to to block them, but you know, not feeding them sadly is one thing that can keep them out away from homes and cars ideally. <laughs> and, and, you know, they can find plenty to forage on on their own. Um, so please don't feed the cranes, even though it's very fun and they're, they're beautiful. Um, also injuries, lots and lots of injuries from disease, from collision, from predators. Think about snapping turtles in those wetlands. Not all conditions are treatable, um, but, you know, sometimes what's best for these birds is to humanely euthanize them so that they don't suffer. So when I talk to people in Wisconsin, I show them this and talk about um, call your local DNR. They probably, every state should have a list of wildlife rehabilitators. Your local veterinarian can maybe even help. Um, it takes a lot of energy to get a bird. So even if there's somebody that can help, the birds don't know that we want to help them. So if it's a wing injury, they can still run. And if it's a leg injury, they can still fly. <laughs> so sometimes it's um, up to nature to take its course, but you can always call us at the Crane Foundation and, and we are always happy to help um, when we can. Some of our most frequently asked questions. So will it repair if the mate is lost? And yep, especially in our area up here with a high density of birds, we've seen uh, a bird that uh, maybe got hit by a car or taken by a predator. Within weeks, the remaining mate is unison calling. So they don't even let the body get cold. <laughs> but you know who wants to go through life alone? So they absolutely will repair if the bird is lost. Can they raise a chick by themselves? Well, we have seen that. It's a little bit easier when the chick is as old as the ones in the bottom right-hand corner, as opposed to the bottom left-hand corner. You know, when they have when one bird raising two chicks by itself, when they're that young is, is pretty difficult to do, but, but they can and, and they do. But a juvenile by itself, same. If it's a small, small chick and it gets separated from its parents or for whatever reason the parents are gone, probably won't make it. But if it can get itself, if it's fledged and it can get itself into a flock of birds, it will be just fine. Often we get this question up here, especially, oh my God, it's the weather is so miserable. Are they okay? They come back early. There's still snow on the ground. The water is frozen. Will they be okay? As a matter of fact, they will. Um, nature has taken care of that. Of course, they are wearing a little down coat. They are very comfortable, um, but they actually have a special circulation system in their legs um, that can help them keep their core uh, uh, warm. And so the, the cold blood from their legs does not make their body cold, but likewise in the summertime, it can also help them cool off. Um, especially if they're roosting in water, if the water isn't frozen, it's at least over 32 degrees. So um, it's often much, much warmer than the surrounding air. So they are tough, tough birds and they will be okay. And here's, I don't, I, I shouldn't even have this in here because there's no way that I can adequately answer this question. <laughs> Certainly not in a, in a short presentation. Um, people hunt cranes because they are wild game. Um, they can be sustainably hunted in many, many places. Um, should they be hunted? That's a personal question. Um, the ecology of cranes, is such that maybe some population should not be hunted. Um, so this suddenly becomes a, a conversation that we need to have amongst each other that, you know, do we even want to hunt cranes? I have often wanted to ask Aldo Leopold if he would have seen this population of birds come back that he so famously eulogized in a Sand County Almanac if he would hunt cranes. That's a very interesting thought experiment. Um, also, how do wind farms affect cranes? The good news is, is that they migrate well above wind farms. They fly during the day so they can see them. Um, there may be more risk from wind farms taking up space where they would forage because they would, do tend to stay away from them. So um, right now it's not so much wind farms as I'm learning more and more solar farms are going in and those are also covering up cornfields where these birds uh, forage on 
very, very often in the wintertime and of course on migration. So um, um, that is something that we're, we're actually tracking on to make sure that we leave enough of these agricultural fields. So millions of migratory birds have fuel um, on their migration. If you would like to know where you would go to find sandhill cranes near you, we have this sandhill finder on our website. And this is kind of fun. It, it pulls uh, eBird information. So on the upper left, you can see that, that density map. And you, so you can see the ebb and flow of migration um, where they're building up. Um, but more specifically, you can see um, any birds that have been reported near you. Likewise, I hope if any of you are e-birders, if not, please do that, because this um, is information that is really useful to help define that expansion of this population. Um, but it's just really superb data that a lot of people can use um, throughout you now, you know, all bird populations. So do, do eBird, it's really great stuff. Finally, thank you. Thank you so much for attending. I hope, I hope you learned something. I hope you have a lot of questions. Um, you're supporting me by just watching this, but if you would like to come and visit us in Wisconsin, please stop by to see our, our, all of our new renovations, our new visitor center there. You can go to craneshop.org, Christmas is coming. It could be a craney Christmas. You could shop for a cause. And we are a uh, membership organization. Uh, your membership helps support our programs worldwide. But all of, all of these things help support our work, um, not just on cranes, but people living in crane areas and a lot, a lot, a lot of habitat work. So maybe I will see you. We close to the public um, October 31st, but we open again next May 1st. And I would love for you to visit. So thank you. Thank you again to the Leidens. It was fantastic to have you support this. And Renee, do we have yes. questions? We sure do, Anne, as you can imagine. Yeah. So here's one from Brian. If the cranes are such a success story, what made the population decline? Oh, yes. It seems kind of... they adapted well to humans. Yeah, yeah, I skipped over that, didn't I? Uh -huh. <laughs> they, that just made them write a, a conservation success story. So <laughs> pre-settlement times, so well well before, oh, it was just yesterday, Indigenous Peoples Day, before Columbus, you know, hit, hit the ground and we had European settlement here, um, this was tall grass prairie. The population of Santo cranes in the, just in the lower 48, they were they were breeding up into Canada too, but they were probably not at the density they are now. Um, but people moving westward, draining wetlands, so nesting areas were reduced, um, plowing up the prairie, and depending on what kind of row crops, it was probably also subsistence hunting, made that population just go down, 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 down. So a combination of, uh, Wisconsin uh, managed to preserve about 50% of its historic wetlands, which is huge. So that had kind of a core breeding area that they were able to expand out into. And they expanded out into this newly transformed landscape that used to be tall grass prairie and is now other grains. Um, you know, there's a, other seed sources than, than prairie. They really, really like corn. So it was really that, that transformation and the adaptability of the sandhills that um, once those those core wetlands where the birds were breeding and this and the hunting was stopped or controlled by and controlled meaning it was stopped, that really allowed the population to rebound. Okay, great. Um, here's another question. Um, what is the expanse of a territory per pair? Ooh, yeah, it's about so. If I can go looking at our, our study area in Briggsville. So we have these great um, um, uh, sedgy, some, some are sedgy, some are cattaily marshes, but you know, these beautiful emergent wetlands and they can, they can build their nest, but often a farm field will, or sometimes these days, someone's yard goes right up to the edge of the wetland. And so these birds um, can maybe be, you know, 50 meters out into the wetland walk a very short distance and have this nice open upland territory um, to forage in. Um, they like that that open nature. So 
one, you know, one or two acres, sometimes we see territories that small. However, in places like Horicon National Wildlife Refuge, um, Nasita National Wildlife Refuge, beautiful wetlands, um, but very, very different levels of productivity, um, wetland productivity, meaning food sources. Um, they would need much, much bigger territories in places like that. They have to travel further to get food. And if they have one or two chicks, even, uh, even bigger area that they have to defend to ensure that there's enough food for them and, and to raise their chicks for, you know, a hundred days until they fledge and they can fly other places. Okay. So it, it, it really depends on, on the area. So, but they can, in our area, we have documented, you know, just a few acres is enough for a Santo Crane family to make it. It could be a five to 10 acres in, an, in a different wetland situation. Okay. Okay, here's a question from Dan. In breeding season, adult cranes have brown feathers, post breeding season, gray feathers. References say the brown feathers are iron stained. I've always had a hard time accepting this explanation given the uniformity of brown color among sandhills. Wouldn't that require a single source of brown stain for the entire US population? Feather stain or breeding season plumage pigmentation? Question. I need to go back there. Oh, so there, that picture right there, mm -hmm. like that. <laughs> that picture on the left is a pair of breeding sandhill cranes. That picture was taken right here on our site. They nested in one of the wetlands that we have here at our headquarters, a wild pair. And you see all those other birds are that lovely slate gray. So that absolutely is iron staining. So we often see that in, in I don't know if it's exclusive, but I, I, I think it is, to breeding birds. They take that wetland soil, and I've, I've seen it, I've witnessed it, they will rub it on their feathers. And that's why the staining stops about right there. They can't, they can't reach up higher than that. So these uh, sandhill cranes do not have a flightless molt. They have a, a gradual molt that happens throughout the year. And you can kind of see it in this picture. There's a few, there's a few of those painted feathers. So these, these are too young. You can see that they don't have that red head. Um, but when they molt out, they molt in those brand new, beautifully gray feathers. And so sometimes they even look speckled like this. So this is, you know, some of the, they retain some of their old stained feathers, but some of the new ones, the brand new nice gray feathers are in there. So it absolutely is, is staining. It okay. is purposeful. It, they are, they are purposefully grabbing that, that nice, organic soil with all that iron uh, uh, ox and it oxidizes their feathers. Wow. It's probably camouflage, um, but it does go back and forth seasonally um, as they molt out those, those red feathers and the gray, new gray ones come in. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. So are sandhill cranes and whooping cranes in competition for the same areas? That's interesting. Um, not yet. Uh, there's just not enough right now. There's there's plenty of room for the wet for the in the wetlands for whooping cranes to make their home, and as a matter of fact, um, apparently nobody told the whooping cranes that they're rare, that they're endangered or anything because they're quite the bully and they will often they're bigger than sandhills and they are they will aggressively chase the sandhills out so they can make their own room. <laughs> That's the good news. <laughs> We have plenty of sandhills right now, so at least it's not, you know, two rare species trying to duke it out. But yeah, they are there. So far, there's plenty of room for all. Okay. And are they affected at all by fertilizer and insecticides from the ag areas? As a matter of fact, that is something that I am very curious about. Um, we, I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how, with everything else that we have going on, how we can do a study like that. Um, that might be why what's affecting that productivity, quite honestly. Mm -hmm. there, right now, that we don't know. But overall, I, I know just by looking at our population and, and the gradual increase in the numbers that we see every year, that it is not harming them at a population level at, at this point. Um, 
So I would still like to know, is there, you know, that sublethal level that's keeping them, you know, if we mm -hmm. took, a, you know, if we all went all organic, would they, would they just explode and everybody would breed every year? Yeah. I don't know. Um, and very, you know, much more concerning uh, for the whooping cranes. Is this why we can't get them to, to fledge chicks um, enough to make it a self-sustaining population? So yeah, we are looking into that, okay. but we don't know. Well, here's a question from Lewis. Are human raised whooping cranes still being trained to migrate south using ultralight aircraft? They are not. Okay. They are not. We are still raising whooping cranes uh, for reintroduction. Okay. Um, we are most since I think the, the last ultralight cohort was was 2015. Okay. Um, and so we are concentrating on parent rearing. So at our facility, we have captive whooping cranes that raise young. Then we take them and we put those the color marks on them so I can identify them. And then we release them out into the wide world of Wisconsin mm -hmm. in the company of older birds. So it's not a 100% a, a adoption, um, more uh, please tolerate this young one <laughs> or even short of that, um, if the if the 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 older birds, um, you know, won't, you know, sometimes they get a little aggressive. Like I don't know who you are, newbie. You know, uh -uh. but as long as the young one keeps its distance, but does what they do, follows them to roost and to forage, and then follows them on migration to learn, then that's exactly what we do. So that is what we have transitioned to since um, the ultralight helped us build up the population enough so now we can introduce these other birds that are raised by real whooping cranes which we hope is much better than people um and they can learn the the migration route from older birds then that's great um before before we lose folks and i want you to please mention the crane count that's done in ohio oh in yes. april so please thank um, you give that a plug because we have folks here that will lo love to volunteer yeah since the 1970s, but more formally as a program here uh, sponsored by ICF in the 80s, we have done an annual Midwest crane count in the spring. And so it, it isn't the formal, like it, it, it's too difficult to tell us what the actual population number is, but it really helps us give an idea of where these birds are expanding to, what wetlands they're using. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's um, two hours and the second, Saturday in April, go out to a local wetland and count cranes is what it is. And it's a beautiful excuse to get out and, and spend a lovely morning at the sunrise. So please go to www.cranecount.org um, and look for information if you're in the upper Midwest. Um, Ohio has been doing a crane count now for two years. Um, and we're looking for more. And so that, that is a really important area, um, this, the, that kind of lower tier. So we know where these birds are breeding and we can kind of better document that expansion of the population. And I'll be sure to include the link in my follow-up message to everyone that registered for Super. Thank you. So that's great. Um, okay, here's a question about banding. Um, how do you capture them and, and I know the bands don't hurt, but do you want to talk a little bit oh, about sure. banding? Yeah. Yeah. How do we catch them? Very carefully. Um, <laughs> so when, so we don't, the, you can see the chick in the upper right hand picture there. We don't, we can't uh, catch them when they're that small. So, but when they're flightless is easiest. So they have to be big enough to hold the bands safely, but not so big that they fly away from us. So that's about six or seven weeks of age. We will we will try to band uh, the flightless chicks. For adults, um, we have to get a little bit more creative. Um, we have used uh, snare techniques um, mostly. Uh, they don't have a flightless molt. So um, other people, you know, like whooping cranes, you could actually try to catch them sometimes if they can't fly away from you. Um, they can still run. Um, and some people use night lighting. So they go out at night and literally it's, it's almost like shining deer, but it's shining cranes. So wow. um, you have to be kind of tricky um, to do that as adults. And so we've gotten uh, good enough that when, then when we put these bands on and the, we take these plastic rings 
and just kind of wrap them around the leg, um, being very careful to avoid putting pressure on their tendons um, at their hock joint, because that you know, picture, you know, like your Achilles tendon essentially on a bird is pretty tender and can be dislocated. So we have our process down now. We take, uh, put the bands on, um, any transmitters, any measurements that we need to take in about 15 to 20 minutes. And then, then we let them go again. And the chicks are, we watch the, the adults so we know where they are and we release the chick into the company of their adults. Um, and they come and get them and lead them back into the wetland and, it, and it, we've gotten it down. So um, we, we may remain safe, but also the birds on that. And of course that is um, the priority. Sure. Okay, so here's, um, Jackie is going to Jasper, Pulaski the last week in November. Is that a good Great. time to go and see Crane? It is, it okay. is. Um, and we, let's see, I think, oh, I, I'm not sure, maybe look on our, our website, savingcranes.org. Um, I'm not sure if it will be on Jasper, Pulaski website, but we have a, uh, a an outreach um, uh, employee in, Indiana that will be present at the Overlook on some Saturdays at Jasper Pulaski oh, in, in during the winter. So look for somebody in a Crane Foundation hat and ask them questions. It's awesome. But it is fantastic. It is, it is a really great. I'm glad that you're going. It's I love going down there. It's really phenomenal. It is fabulous. So here, here's um a question. In September, a couple were surprised to see two Santo cranes at Bombay Hook National Wildlife Refuge in Delaware. Oh, was that a one off or are they expanding that far east? They absolutely are. Okay. Another, another, you know, I have it in my head trying to figure out how we can pull off doing more research into how these birds are expanding to the east. Um, Sandhills have been um, breeding in all the New England states for well over a decade now. Um, well into Quebec and even in the far, farther eastern Canadian provinces, uh, definitely Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, maybe. Uh, so not not very many, but they are absolutely there. Excellent. So that's, you know, how do they get there? So they, they're migrating down the Atlantic Coast Flyway. So they're even wintering in North and, well, mostly in South Carolina. Okay. Um, um, but definitely you, you could see them in Delaware. Okay, excellent. Um, so someone asked the status of sandhill cranes in Ohio, and they are listed as endangered in the state of Ohio. Um, and their question is, how can we encourage more breeding pairs? I half jokingly tell people to plant corn if you want. <laughs> um, it basically is the the right kind of wetland. It it really is that that breeding part of the real estate. So you can see in that middle picture. Um, that looks mostly reed canary grass, but they they will breed in that. So you see the depth of water there. I know um, that it has to be shallowish water, but but very gradual uh, depth, um, so they can get away from the shore. Um, that will encourage them in and having that that beautiful emergent uh, vegetation. Um, if you if you have it eventually. They will find it and they okay. will start breeding. Excellent. Um, gosh, let me see here. There is a movement across the U.S. in agriculture called regenerative agriculture. This involves less disturbance of a soil, more diversity of crops planted and harvested, keeping the soil covered and the use of cover crops between harvested crops and the incorporation of grazing livestock into the system, would this be beneficial to sandhill crane habitat? I don't know how to measure that. I okay. love regenerative agriculture. I love the idea of it. I love what it could do. And I wish that, unfortunately we have to do it at such a scale to, to turn some things around, but, okay. so I love it. Um, I guess the, really the best answer to that is it certainly would not hurt sandhill okay. population okay um and and just the, the the greater good of that type of agriculture across the board you know if if one or two sandhill pairs might not breed as much as they they would have if they have mm -hmm. these big open cornfields sure um 
I, I, you know, I think, I think that the greater benefit of it, it certainly wouldn't, it certainly doesn't, wouldn't hurt them at a population level, I guess is what I would say. Okay, sounds good. Um, here's someone that saw a single sandhill crane at a natural area. Is that normal? Depends on when, at what time okay. of year. So okay. at, in, in end of March through April, maybe into May, if you see a single bird, I would say, oh, that might be the bird of a nesting pair and the other birds on the nest. So one bird incubates and then for, you know, three or four hours and then they switch out throughout the day. Okay. Um, so if you see a single bird, it might be that. Um, okay. Otherwise, it could be a bird that hasn't paired yet. Could be a bird that lost its mate. Okay. Could be a young bird that's just on its, you know, you know, just wandering about okay. the landscape. Sounds good. Well, I'm going to get one more question in here, Anne, and this is international. Right. So I don't know if this is, if you're going to know about this, but someone asked if you know anything about sandhill cranes in Finland. Are there sandhill cranes in Finland? As far as we know, they haven't made it to Finland, but what they have okay. in Finland is the Eurasian crane, which are very, very, they're, they're, they're somewhat similar looking to sandhills. They're about the same size, a lot more black. Okay. Um, they still have that red head. And so, yeah, some of the, the most northerly breeding birds are in Scandinavia. Oh, wow. um, if you would like to see, so since, we, since we're talking international very quickly, I'll put in a plug for our website, okay. um, savingcranes.org. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a species field guide and you can look at all 15 species of crane where they occur. So if you look up Eurasian crane, mm -hmm. you'll see the, the breeding range of the Eurasian is, is vast all through Eurasia. Okay. <laughs> so, and you'll see that they are definitely in, in Finland. So those birds um, have, they actually have a reintroduction in England and that's gone very well. So that they putting them back in their, their previous range on the, uh, in the UK. Mm -hmm. um, and they have recently even made it over into Ireland on their own. So they're okay. kind of repopulating some of their previously occupied areas too. Wow. Well, listen, Anne, thank you. This is fascinating. You've given us a wealth of information on Sandhill Cranes. I appreciate you um, going back to the office and, and, <laughs> and doing this program for us this evening. So It was my pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Everyone enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you.